Welcome to the program today. I'm Millicent Walker in Lagos. Donors have been pledging millions to helping Ukraine with whatever it needs and have rounded off the figure so far to $6.5 billion. The event co-hosted by Poland and Sweden in cooperation with the EU, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and European Council President Charles Michel in attendance. We'll return to this in a bit. But staying with another development in the war, Russian gas giant Gazprom today announced it will use the onshore capacity of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline for Russia's domestic needs. Posting on Telegram earlier, Gazprom says this is due to the phase that the pipeline is currently not in use, so it has decided to use the gas to supply the northwestern regions of Russia. Nord Stream 2 is a 1,200 kilometer pipeline under the Baltic Sea, which was designed to take gas from the Russian coast near St. Petersburg to Lubmin in Germany. Back in February, Germany suspended the proofs of giving the pipeline between it and Russia an operating license, effectively stopping the project until further notice. In the meantime, political advisor to President Volodymyr Zelensky, Oleksiy Aristovich, says Ukraine is unlikely to launch a counteroffensive against Russia before mid-June when it hopes to receive more weapons from allies. He also says he is not, he does not expect Russia's offensive in Ukraine to produce any significant results by Russia's so-called Victory Day on the 9th of May when it celebrates defeating Nazi Germany in World War II. He also says fighting is ongoing at the Azovstal steelworks plant, where Ukrainian fighters and some civilians are holed up in the city of Mariupol. Meanwhile, happening in Europe today, leaders uh, we mentioned the donors' conference to raise funds still ongoing to help Ukraine. Serbia supports the activities on the. Thank you for all the pledges. I have just received the final number, and I'm very glad to announce that all of us managed to mobilize $6.5 billion. These are pledges which were put, and thank you. Romania took the initiative of liberalizing transport conditions for Ukrainian exports, especially for agricultural products. These measures allow Ukraine to continue exporting ex 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 sorry, essential agriculture output thus mitigating the volatility and disruption of international markets while generating much needed income for our Ukrainian neighbors. Serbia supports the activities undertaken by the United Nations and the international humanitarian actors to urgently address the needs of the most vulnerable categories affected by the conflict. And for that reason, I take this opportunity to pledge 3 million euros from Serbia for the humanitarian response in Ukraine. And British Prime Minister Boris Johnson today hosted his Japanese counterpart at Number 10 Downing Street, where both held bilateral talks. Mr. Fumio Kishida, who became Prime Minister and won an election last year, had been on an extended visit to Southeast Asia before he arrived in London to address the city ahead of his meeting with Mr. Johnson. At his presentation in Guildhall, Prime Minister Kishida said Japan's economy would continue to see robust growth and that its shift to an upgraded version version of capitalism means that investors could back the powerhouse with confidence. He told the audience that his new economic policy is an upgraded form of capitalism in which public and private sectors work together. Japan is aiming to generate a virtuous circle of economic growth and redistribution of wealth under this agenda, bringing cautious Japanese firms under pressure to raise wages. Prime Minister Kishida acknowledged that his country would face labor challenges and says companies there need to become more diverse and that the government would introduce tax incentives to encourage the private sector to boost wages and further R&D investment is needed to hit international levels. Like countries around the world, Japan has been hit by rising energy, food and living costs that have been exacerbated in recent months by a sharp decline in its yen currency and the war in Ukraine. 
A newly released United Nations report says countries around the world are likely to face even more severe food shortages in 2022, with the ongoing war in Ukraine set to have the biggest impact on lower-income countries. Secretary General Antonio Guterres says in the report that the world faces an unprecedented hunger crisis, with food prices having never been higher and the lives and livelihoods of millions left hanging in the balance. Jointly issued by 17 agencies, including the World Food Programme and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the report covers the food situation of 53 countries in 2021 and forecasts the situation in 2022 for 41 countries. Or, or, or commodities coming out of Ukraine. There are commodities coming out of Russia, but they are coming up out at a much higher cost. Now put yourself in the position where, in a low-income country or low, lower-middle-income country, where you were, let's say, spending 50% of your income or more on food, and suddenly you are got your, your food got more expensive. This is what we are seeing in many parts of the, of, of the world as we speak. And joining us for more on the program, counterterrorism expert and lawyer, Mr. John Essien, joins us from London, the UK. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'd like to begin with reports uh, from earlier today. The Ukrainian commander leading troops hold up uh, in the steel plants in Mariupol, saying that it is difficult, bloody battles are being fought at the Azovstal uh, steel works, and saying that uh, this is the last stronghold of resistance in Mariupol. Um, what's your take? Do you think that Russia will succeed in this fight? Well, it, it probably will because uh, while Russia has the weapons and the and the personnel, uh, the the uh, so that the Ukrainian soldiers who who've been held up in the steel uh, plants have not had any replenishments, not in personnel, not in food or water, not even in um, in equipment, in in level uh, level replenishment. So. And Russia wants to be able to to at least secure this victory so he could celebrate it as a uh, as a symbol for the commemoration of the uh, of the winning of the Nazis in in 1945 during the Second World War. So it'll be not just a symbolic loss, but a strategic one as well. But given the fact that they've been able to hold up Russian soldiers who'd rather have been deployed to the east, to the Donbas, where there's a, 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 a battle to secure the Donbas. The, the Ukrainian soldiers have been have been able to do. They've done exceedingly well to be able to hold them up here for the time they've had, for the time they've held them up. So they've done brilliantly so far. But I think that in another couple of weeks, maybe less, that um, they'll be able to take uh, Mariupol and then divide uh, Ukraine, and, and that'll be sad. What do you think this will do to President Zelensky and also especially the Ukrainian troops who are there in the front lines? Uh, there will be a loss of morale, but not for very long, because they know it's a short-term uh, defeat. Besides, it's, uh, it's a defeat of a battle, not the war. That, that is just one battle. And uh, But one of the things that will concern them is that that is the elite of the, of the Ukrainian forces. That's, that's the very best. They are the most experienced, so you'll be a loss to, to lose them because uh, the Russians will probably ensure that they'll they kill uh, rather than maybe capture them as, uh, as, uh, as prisoners of war. They'll probably almost, uh, they'll almost suddenly kill them, so that'll be sad as well. But uh, from the beginning of this war, Russia had intended to take all of Ukraine. When that changed, they changed strategies and said that all they wanted was the Donbass, just to save faith. But every, the, uh, since the war began, uh, there has been evidence of a lack of training of the soldiers, of strategic planning, of uh, uh, operational deployment and execution. All, everything has gone wrong. And uh, the command control uh, decision-making capabilities have been compromised, which is why 12 of their generals have been killed. So a lot has gone wrong and will keep going wrong. Because uh, there's not, you know, you need a lot of time, not even years, but decades, 
to resolve the problems that, that Russia has. So I think that the tacticians within the Ukrainian army know that this is just a, 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 a just a loss, a, 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 a temporary loss, that they'll regain a Mariupol invention. Now, um, I think this happened earlier in the week, the latest decision by the EU on, you know, phasing out Russian oil. I mean, this must be very significant um, in this war. And this is also seeing as Gazprom uh, is saying that it will be using Nord Stream 2 um, for Russia's domestic needs. Uh, they had to come to that decision eventually. I think it was uh, Germany and uh, I think Slovakia and uh, Hungary that were dragging their feet. But they, they had to come to a decision. Uh, it, it, it will have ramifications in, in the short term. But eventually, everyone has to tighten up their belts. Eventually, it will help because they're looking to grind down Russia. They're looking to strategically weaken Russia so it's never able to to have the audacity to, to, to attack any country the way it's done in Ukraine. But in order to do that, they have to make compromises as well. And if it's losing uh, Russian oil and gas for, for the, till, you know, till the end of the year, then that is what it is. You know, it's a far bigger gain taking Russia out than them, uh, uh, you know, having to rely on Russian, on Russian, uh, Russian oil. I want us to take a closer look at NATO and especially, you know, its role in, in this invasion. Um, yesterday we heard Germany saying it is supporting the move. It will support Finland and Sweden uh, to join NATO. But doesn't this aggravate uh, Russia? And this is especially where Germany is concerned. Russia uh, is its major supply of oil. Uh, from the very beginning of this war, NATO had been treating it like uh, an optional intervention. It didn't really want to to aggravate Russia, and Russia is because Russia knows how the West thinks. It's lived uh, uh, next to the West for years. It knows how it thinks. It's exploiting all of that to advance its agenda. So, it, I think it's high time they made that move. They can do without Russia's oil. And if, if uh, Finland expresses uh, an intention and Sweden to join NATO, they should join NATO. Because if they don't, then it'll just be giving Russia a launching pad. We cannot afford, the West cannot afford for a stalemate in this war. There has to be a decisive victory in Ukraine's interest, because then that protects Europe. So they have to, if it's uh, Finland and uh, Sweden uh, joining NATO, then that is what it is. Russia is was telling that if they join NATO, Sorry, Sorry to interrupt, John. I was going to say that, I mean, is there a threat uh, with, you know, the moves Finland and Sweden are trying to make? Is there really a threat? And don't you think that, you know, going forward with this would just worsen the relations? There, there is a threat, but whether the only, Russia doesn't really have any, if, you, if you've, if you've I'm, I'm sure you've paid attention to this war since it began, Russia has done really badly. And it's really exposed itself because of, uh, we had overestimated Russia. If the West had not overestimated Russia, this war would have been over ages ago. Now it's been exposed. We know its capabilities. We know it's. We know it needs a lot of time to rebuild because it's not. Russia has lost more personnel in this war in one month than it did in in one decade when it was in Afghanistan, and it's lost more equipment as well. So that just tells you the sorry state of Russia's army. All it has is is nuclear weapons. It's not the only one with nuclear weapons. And it's threatening to, to uh, position nuclear weapons in, in, uh, along the borders in the, the Baltic states if, if uh, Sweden and, uh, and uh, what's the other country, if they join NATO. But already, he's already, he's had nuclear weapons in that area since 2016. And he had them upgraded in 2018. So now he's pretending he's never had and the West knows as well that it already has nuclear weapons. If, and if he threatens nuclear weapons, the West should make sure that he understands that the, have, the West has the capability, it has the political will to defend it, its allies and defend itself. If it, if it ever tries using nuclear weapons, that is what he's going to get back. And I, I, as a matter of fact, that should not be the limit because what the West usually does is say, if you attack me, then my response will be measured and proportionate. That is not sufficient because 
that will go into his response calculus. He'll prepare for the measured and pro proportionate and, and use nuclear weapons anyway. So they have to go a step beyond that and say, we don't have to be measured, we don't have to be proportionate, but we'll respond. So you, you, you think through what you're doing before you do it. But isn't the threat of nuclear weapons just, you know, uh, bluff, so to speak? Because, I mean, it would definitely affect everyone. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. We've had nuclear weapons since 1945, and it's never been used in all of that time for that precise reason, because it amounts to mutually assured destruction of anyone who uses it. And even if Russia were to use it, you, you can't silo the ramifications of a deployment or dis, a discharge because it'll affect even Russia as well. It'll affect its troops. It'll affect the, the Russian civilians. So he needs to think through all of this before he does anything silly. Besides, it's not just his decision. He has people he has to consult, consult with, and I don't think that's stupid. You know, so we should set aside that threat and, uh, and be objective. And the Kremlin has said that um, he, they think the U.S. is dragging Finland and Sweden um, into NATO. Uh, you might disagree or agree. Um, but I'd like to ask, are there still neutral countries in Europe? Or do you think that Europe has moved, um, you know, from what it used to be to something else? The only neutral countries in Europe are Austria, Ireland, Cyprus, uh, I forgot the last one. There were six. Uh, well, there are still six since uh, uh, Finland and Sweden haven't joined yet. But when they join, then it will be just four now. But eventually, with what has happened, they'll all have to come into NATO. I, I, and I think that will really happen. Because Russia, after this war, Russia will not be much of a threat. Everyone can see that. So there shouldn't be any problem joining NATO. We'd like to thank you. Uh, Mr. John Essen is a counterterrorism expert joining us from London. Always a pleasure having you join us on the programme. Thank you for having me. As the United States has passed the great milestone of one million deaths from the COVID pandemic, its citizens are increasingly turning to cremation to handle end of life for the victims. Cremation has long been a more cost-effective way for managing death than burial or other options in the U.S. The average cost of the cremation comes to just under $7,000, or about 1000 less than a burial. This is according to the U.S. National Funeral Directors Association. And the growth of cremation during the pandemic is of a piece with cremation surpassing burial as the generally preferred choice for dealing with death there. The rate of U.S. citizens choosing that over burial, in fact, outpays the 16% increase in deaths the country saw in 2020, according to the Centers for Disease Control. For a lot of families, honestly, it was sort of their only choice. I mean, uh, most of these debts people were not prepared for, you know, didn't have the, I'd say, financially to, to prepare for a burial. It's obviously very expensive. So cremation, one, provides a more economic option for them. And it also sort of, you know, allows them to deal with the death that day, you know, to hand, you know, once the body's cremated, now they have the, you know, the cremated remains returned to them. They can then plan to do memorial services or events for the family at a later time just because of what's going on with COVID. So that was, again, I think a lot of families had to go that route, didn't have much choice. You know, if they wanted to do a full burial service, you have to buy a plot somewhere. You know, you just, it, it, they weren't prepared for things like that. Nobody was. It was way crazy, especially I'd say the first, you know, two months of the pandemic, like March, April, May of 2020 were really, I mean, it was to the point where we had to turn cremations away. And I, this was every crematory in New York City, not just Greenwood, obviously. So um, just trying to keep up with the demand, you know, from manpower to, you know, having the you know, crematory working properly. We were basically working 18 hour days, seven days a week, uh, trying to keep up, which was tough. Um, after those few months, it just kind of became, you know, everybody says the new normal. That's kind of, you know, where we were. Um, then with Omicron last year, we actually, it was actually, I would say, as far as how many bodies we cremated, it was, it was more. It was, we did, I think, about 4,500 cremations yesterday, which is last in 2021. Which 
The World Health Organization estimates that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused the deaths of nearly 15 million people around the world. That is 13% more deaths than normally expected over two years. The WHO believes many countries undercounted the numbers who died from COVID. Only 5.4 million were reported. The report says India's COVID-19 toll is the highest in the world. In India, there were 4.7 million COVID deaths. It says 10 times the official figures and almost a third of COVID deaths globally. But the Indian government has questioned the estimate, saying it has concerns about the methodology, but other studies have come to similar conclusions about the scale of deaths in the country. In November 2020, researchers at the World Mortality Data Set, a global repository that provides updated data on deaths from all causes, asked authorities in India to provide information. But India's main statistical office told the researchers that, uh, and this is according to a scientist who co-created the data, to set that the information were not available. Staying with the World Health Organization, the global body has reported cases and deaths, it says, are continuing to decline with reported weekly deaths at their lowest since March 2020. WHO's Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus says that driven by Omicron subvariants, there's an increase in reported cases in the Americas and Africa. South African scientists who identified Omicron late last year have now reported two more Omicron subvariants as the reason for a spike in cases in the country. Globally, reported cases and deaths from COVID-19 are continuing to decline, with reported weekly deaths at their lowest since March 2020. But these trends, while welcome, don't tell the full story. Driven by Omicron subvariants, we are seeing an increase in reported cases in America's and Africa. The South African scientists who identified Omicron late last year have now reported two more Omicron subvariants, BA4 and BA5, as the reason for a spike in cases in South Africa. It's too soon to know whether these new subvariants can cause more severe disease than other Omicron subvariants. But early data suggests vaccination remains protective against severe disease and death. Testing and sequencing remain absolutely critical. The BA4 and BA5 subvariants were identified because South Africa is still doing the vital genetic sequencing that many other countries have stopped doing. In many countries, we're essentially blind to how the virus is mutating. We don't know what's coming next. Coupled with low investment in early diagnosis, it's simply not acceptable that in worst pandemic in a century, innovative treatments that can save lives are not reaching those that need them. We're playing with a fire that continues to burn us. Meanwhile, manufacturers are posting record profits. WHO supports fair reward for innovation. But we cannot accept prices that make life-saving treatments available to the rich and out of reach for the poor. This is a moral failing. A public health expert, professor of virology, Professor Yuali Tomari, joins me now virtually. Professor, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Melissa. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'd like to begin with the reports we heard from the WHO. It estimates that COVID-19 pandemic has caused the deaths of nearly 15 million people. What do you make of that report? Yeah, I think the WHO uh, Tedros has, uh, I listened to him, and of course he is telling what, what is being, the figures are just basically and uh, not the real figures especially in the African region. And so what we're getting, maybe in other country, countries of, of the world where they're doing proper testing, we are getting something close to. You also heard that uh, India was disputing the figures they had. So everybody that's in a country where at least they're doing something. Here, we're not even doing anything. Like you said, a lot of countries have abandoned. So we don't really know. We're walking blindly and we are, we are deaf to what is happening to us. China yeah. is a good example. They're getting cases coming up. 
America is hitting the one million death uh, level this this period. And your your trailer actually showed now they are cremating bodies. So the thing, the problem is still there. Mm. Professor, um, now also in the same report, uh, the WHO said that um, India, yes, indeed had the highest uh, total um, excess debts in this estimation. It also uh, put Russia, Indonesia, the U.S., Brazil, Mexico, Peru uh, in that um, in that um, uh, place. Then, uh, on the other hand, it says low excess mortality rates. Um, China. Uh, China is on that list. I think China is still pursuing the uh, policy of zero COVID involving the mass testing and the quarantines. And of course, we know Australia, which is also in uh, the lower excess mortality rates, imposed a strict travel restrictions uh, to keep the virus at bay. And so did Japan and so did Norway. These countries in this bracket, um, what, what do you make of, of them? I think it is clear. I mean, countries that have strict zero COVID uh, programs, you know, are showing, detecting it early and treating the cases before it becomes serious. And that's what is happening. The other countries where you are mentioning, where you're having a large cases, there's this freedom of expression, this thing that, no, we, we, we were tired of COVID, but COVID is not tired of, of, our, of us. And that's why we see the disparity in those different countries where you have large number of cases occurring in the U.S., and smaller number of cases occurring in, say, Australia and China, for example. Right in the middle is us, uh, our low number is probably not because they are low, but because we are just not testing. I mean, you see, even in my country, uh, you see the NCDC report, uh, like only three three cases in two states testing out of 36, you know, or something of that nature. And that's what we are seeing. So the, the, in the figures, the countries where they're getting the numbers, they are testing. In the countries where they're getting the low numbers, like China and others, they are actually doing the right thing and trying to have a zero COVID uh, system, in which case their cases are lower, Australia and those other countries. The other places where there's freedom of expression, freedom of whatever, they are getting the big cases. In the Africa, we have the freedom and we have uh, the freedom of not even reporting, which is the double freedom of not following the situation, not reporting, and we think we have a fewer, a fewer number of cases. In Africa, South Africa, where they are doing something great, uh, you are seeing the numbers. They are showing the the up, up surging numbers. So if you don't test, if you don't detect, then you don't know where you have the cases. That's what is happening. Indeed, and that report really talked about uh, the academics who compiled it admitted that the estimates were more speculative for sub-Saharan Africa countries there. They said because there was little data uh, on deaths in the region, they said there were no reliable statistics in 41 out of 54 uh, countries in Africa. Um, it's really interesting. Um, they, they were really saying that it's important to get this data. Uh, in fact, one of them said um, it is important that um, it's a disgrace that people can be born and die, and then we have no record of them uh, passing. Um, what do you think this is, a lesson for, for Nigeria, also a lesson for Africa? Because this also takes back, us back to what we heard and what was said, uh, that you know th there might be people dying on the streets of Africa. And could this also still be happening and with our not testing, and um, perhaps with the poor healthcare system we still have on this part of the continent? Yeah, yeah certainly, I mean, I mean, we're not seeing the dying on the street. Or it doesn't mean that people are not dying. We're not looking out for them. And we got, you see, part of the initial problem we had was that the West decided, or whatever, that if it came to Africa, we're all going to be dying on the streets. Then we didn't die on the streets. They'll say, ah, the West has come again. Uh, we're not dying. And then we abandon what we should be doing. It doesn't mean people are not dying. People are dying. Let me give you a good example. If you look at our figures for Lassa fever in Nigeria, in 2020, the numbers went down almost half. Now, when we began to begin to I mean, forget COVID and focus on other things, the numbers of Lassa fever cases are rising, are doubling. So we abandoned testing. Everybody put everything under COVID, and that's the situation. We are not reporting the cases, and, but then people are dying. The, the, the studies done in, I think it was in Kenya, showed actually that, you know, it was 50, 60 times the number of figures that, that are being provided as actually the number of people who die from COVID. So we are not testing, we are not checking, and this is, I think, a prompt lesson for us. Without data, you can't plan. 
Without data, you don't know what you have. Without data, you cannot make any headway in the, in the control program that you are doing. Patients, which we've seen uh, of the virus over the past uh, two years. I mean, would, would you say that the symptoms have also mutated as well? And I'm asking this uh, because, you know, many wonder with vaccines, do we expect more vaccines? And this is to fortify against these uh, mutations. Funny enough, the, the symptoms have been the same. Most, 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 uh, in most of these basic things we had from the beginning. It took some time to know what it was. But after the first six months, we basically knew what the symptoms of COVID were. Uh, gradually, some people went into what we call the long COVID. But basically, the, the symptoms were, were, were the same. You know, you had the uh, shortness of breath, some confusion, and that kind of thing that would be having. But uh, each person comes up with different. In fact, you can list almost 200 type of symptoms that are coming. But the basic issue is that, you know, those basic four things about shortness of breath, you know, respiratory problems, and those other things we, we are talking about. And when it becomes a longer, uh, what you call the long COVID, you have, you know, some kind of confusion coming into the, into the additional symptoms. So the symptoms have not changed, more or less, that they remain basically the same. But of course, the viruses have changed, and that's why we're seeing the upsurges that we are finding. You, you had, I mean, a report also talked about uh, different variants of the B, uh, B, A, B, B, B2, B3, B4, B4, B5, which are now coming. And I think that's a lesson for all of us. COVID is not gone yet. It's still around, and it's still mutating. And we don't know what the next one will be like. And that's why we shouldn't let off our guard like we have done in most African countries, and especially in Nigeria. Professor Tomori, do you expect modified booster shots and do you expect people should be open to taking them? Actually, we had a meeting today at the WHO group in which we discussed this same issue. Should we continue to use what is on? They are making new vaccines now made out of the Omicron. And there's some suggestions, should we change to that? But then a lot of confusions are going to occur. Many African countries are not even vaccinated. The vaccines we have is of the old index virus. And therefore, to tell people, abandon that one and start with this one, I don't think so. I think the likelihood would be we continue to use whatever it is we have. And if new Omicron viruses come, uh, vaccines come, perhaps they could become used as the boosters. But right now, we stick with what we have and, and continue. Uh, like I said, we, uh, even our uh, Minister of Health did mention some of the fact that we have a lot of vaccines around and people are not taking them. So we need to begin to get that awareness to our people. COVID is still around. Your best protection is your vaccine. Please go out for the vaccination. And perhaps before I let you go, uh, Professor Tomari, I would like to get your thoughts on China's policy. We know that, you know, at the beginning, it seemed like there were so much numbers and then he took the measures, uh, the zero COVID policy, and then it started seeing a rise in numbers. But of course, he was also taking extra measures uh, to shut down cities and do um, mass testing. Um, this sort of strict uh, procedure to tackling COVID-19, do you think that it is working? And it's also important to note that uh, in this study of the WHO, it is one of the countries in the low excess mortality rate. Yeah, in fact, a good good thing about that, what China is telling us is that we're not free of COVID until COVID is gone in every country. And the important thing is that the figures you expect, if you look at what is happening, if if China had not come in with the zero, code, some, uh, zero COVID structure, they would probably will have more cases than that. Part of the problem that may be happening with, with China, yes, they vaccinated a large number of their people, but what about the, the when you break it down to the age groups, we begin to see some gaps. And perhaps what we're seeing now is that since COVID is around and the people see coming to the people, maybe those people, that group of people that already had gotten the vaccination are the ones that are coming down with the infection. So yes, China has done a great thing by having this, but then it is a continuous exercise. If zero COVID has to be zero COVID. It's not 0 0.01 COVID. And when you leave a group of your people that are not fully vaccinated, then you have a, a gap on which any virus can come in and cause more coming. And that's what they're doing. But of course, China is reacting quite, quite uh, appropriately and making sure that you go back to the zero COVID test and, uh, uh, system and ensure that uh, it doesn't spread. It's spreading. Imagine the population of China. I mean, if, if they are let go like what we're going, it can be a more disastrous situation than we have.
and they're also making successes with their vaccination. We'd like to thank you. Always a pleasure having you join us. Professor Iwali Tomori is also the Chairman, Special Advisory Committee on COVID-19 in Nigeria. Thank you for joining us on The World Today. Thank you, Ms. My, my big pleasure. Thank you. Well, staying in China, um, they've launched, um, this is away from COVID-19, they've launched a Long March 2D rocket to place a group of eight satellites in space. Satellite Jilin-1 Kung Fu 01C together with seven Jilin-1 Gaofen 03D satellites were lifted at 10.38, that's Beijing time, from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in the northern province of Shanxi and soon enter the preset orbit. Having a wide coverage, Jilin 1 Khan 401C will be used to provide commercial remote sensing data services for sectors such as land resources, mineral exploration, and smart city construction. This was the 419th flight mission of the Long March rocket series. And the third long-duration team of astronauts launched by SpaceX to the International Space Station, ISS, for NASA, safely departed. They departed the orbiting outpost earlier today to begin their descent back to Earth, capping a six-month science mission. The SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule carrying three U.S. NASA astronauts and a German astronaut from the European Space Agency on dock from the ISS at 1.20 a.m. to embark on a return flight flight expected to last about 23 hours. Live video showing the capsule drifting away by, from the station as the two vehicles soared high over Australia was shown on a NASA webcast. Wearing helmeted white and black spacesuits, the four astronauts were seen strapped into the crew cabin uh, shortly before the spacecraft separated from the space station orbiting some uh, 250 miles. Now, if all goes smoothly, the crew, Dragon Craft, dubbed Endurance, will parachute into the sea off the coast of Florida at 12.43 a.m. That's tomorrow, Friday. The endurance crew consisting of American astronauts Tom Mashburn, 61, Rajak Shah, uh, 44, and Kayla Baron, 34, along with his crim mate Matthias Mara, 52. They arrived at the space station November 11. Their departure is coming a week after they welcomed their replacement team aboard the station, also currently home to three Russian Cosmo astronauts. And the Crew Dragon Endurance has undocked from the... Well, Colombia has extradited Dario Antonio Usaga, known as Otonel. This is to the United States. Uh, he's accused uh, of drug trafficking and leader of the Clan del Golfo criminal group. The extradition to its top ally is one of the main weapons in the Andean country's arsenal for fighting drug trafficking, as well as one of the outcomes most feared by the drug traffickers. Otonel, who, according to Colombian authorities, trafficked between 180 and 200 tons of cocaine a year with the clan del Golfo was detained last October in Antoka province. In a video message, President Ivan Duque compared Otonel to diseased drug lord Pablo Escobar. The process of sending the accused drug trafficker to the U.S. began after Colombia's top administrative tribunal lifted a provisional order suspending his extradition. He has been on this incredible mission to ride his motorbike from London to Lagos. I'm talking about none other than Kunli Adeonju, who's close enough to this mission, as he is, uh, we'll find out where he is at the moment, uh, and giving him a warm reception by the Nigerian mission. Uh, he's been documenting his journey on his uh, social media handles. One of his most recent posts said uh, the ride would be his longest since he started out. Well, he joins us uh, now. Um, Hello, Kunle. Can you hear me? Welcome. Thank you for joining us on the program. You are in Dakar, Senegal? All right. I'm in Dakar. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, so we understand you were given a warm reception at the Nigerian mission today. It was, it was incredible. You know, I'm, I'm blown out. That's what I should say. I was actually, you know, touched by the ambassador because... He reached out to me, you know, he searched me out on the internet, he reached out to me, he called me yesterday in the night. And I actually said, I want to come see you in your hotel. 
And I said to him, I said, sir, you can come see me in my hotel. I'm the one to come see you. So I'm actually, you know, impressed by the humility, you know, of the ambassador. It's a, it's a fine gentleman, uh, deep intellect, you know. He's, he's a guy you want to have conversation with. So I'm actually impressed with, uh, with the ambassador's reception today. Now, Kune, a lot of people are dying to know what inspired you to take on this challenge. Okay, well, you see, for me, it's one of those before I die things. You know, some of those things you want to do, my bucket list, those things I want to do before I finally, you know, leave this earth and go back meet my maker. So for me, it's one of those things. I, the, the world is like a book, you know. With every place you visit, it's like opening another page in that book. So I want to see as much as I can in this beautiful book God has given us. I want to travel everywhere, see places, you know, have that experience, meet people, you know, experience people and places. God created us as a natural explorer. You know, that's why he created this diverse world with so much diversity and unique interest in it. So it would be a waste of my life, that's my perception, to just sit down in my little cocoon and think I've lived my life. That is no. So I want to go all out. I want to see so many places. I want to experience people, places, culture. I want to be able to feel that so that when I, maybe when I'm 90, when I'm 100, when I'm ready to go back to my maker, I can look back to my life and say, yes, I have lived. I didn't just come here to exist, but I've actually lived to experience this world. So that is my motivation to doing this. And, you know, for a moment when you said that, I thought maybe, um, you know, you had a terminal illness or something, and, and that's why you uh, wanted to do this. Because, I mean, not everybody no, no, just wakes up and says they want to, on the motorbike, uh, Lagos to London, London to Lagos. Well, it's, I don't have any terminal illness. I'm very healthy, I tell you. I can actually tell you that the last time I went to hospital will probably be when I was like 13 or 14. So I've been a guy that I've enjoyed good health. Thank God for that. And I have a very good, healthy lifestyle. So, but, you know, like, living for me is not just, you know, I don't want to, I'm not the kind of person that live to work. I work so that I can live. So any resources, any money I make is because I want to live a good life with it. So for me, that is my definition of living. So I want to see, I want to see, we are, like I said, we are created as a natural explorer. If you look at people today, we talked about, I mean, we've been talking about in the last 100 years or 200 years, look at people like uh, Christopher Columbus uh, from uh, Americo Vespucci, the guy that discovered that the North America, I mean, Brazil is actually part of America, not a different continent. These are very well-to-do people, but they left the comfort of their home because of that natural exploration, explorer spirit in them. And they went to discover. The guy has been gone for almost like 200 years, but we're still talking about America Vespucci, we're still talking about Christopher Columbus and so many other people. When I'm gone, I want people to talk about me too. I want to do things, I want to explore, I want to see places, I want to okay. leave. I don't want mm. to exist. Share with us some of those unique experiences you encountered up until now. Well, it's actually been a very, you know, an eye opener, you know, passing through, uh, left London for France. That's uh, buggies in France, from buggies to um, Girona in Spain, from Girona to Valencia, from Valencia to Cartagena. That's in Spain also, then from Cartagena to Algeciras, then to Tangier in uh, Morocco, then also from Tangier to Rabat to Casablanca, Marrakesh, then to Agadir. So it's then I got here to Layoun, Layoun down to Western Sahara, Mauritania, and now I'm in Senegal. Now, if you look at it, I've traversed two different cultures. Meeting people, seeing in the same country how the culture, cultural dynamics of people changes has been quite amazing. And uh, for me, also, one of the most high moments or the touching point on this trip was actually my ride through the mountain pass. You know, um, the Atlas Mountain in Morocco actually stretch over 2,500 kilos, and you know that cuts off almost Morocco from uh, Algeria. However, there is a mountain pass, you know, a road of twisties that is made across the mountain that takes you to the top of the Atlas Mountain, then you descend with it. It wasn't on my route, 
it's actually way off. But because I want to experience what it is like to ride on a twisters. Actually, that road is being regarded as the most uh, dangerous road in Africa, and one of the most dangerous roads in the world. But I want to know what it feels like. I want to feel the adrenaline, you know? And I went there, I rode it. And I can tell you, the road live up to all the expectations, everything I've read about the road. It's okay. a road where, you know, you cannot afford to be distracted for a second. If you are distracted for a second, you, you take your eyes off the road, you take your thoughts wanders away for one second, you could die, you could go off the ravine. You know, because both sides of the road is a ravine, you know, you're in a mountain. So there's a ravine, you could go up the ravine and it's death. So, you know, I like, sometimes I like things to put me on that edge. I'm that kind of a person, that's how I'm wired. I want to ask, and this is just if you can wrap up in about a minute. What's next for you? When do you arrive, Lagos, and then what's next for you? Uh, based on the plan, I should get in Lagos on Sunday, the 22nd of May. Okay, so when I get in Lagos, I guess there will be an, uh, some reception. Then thereafter, what is next to me? The adventure continues. I have a series of bucket list of things I want to do. So riding from London to Lagos is just one of them. There's still quite a couple. Some of them could be riding almost all the countries of the world. Number two is climbing uh, Mount Elbrus in Russia, climbing Akakongwa in, in Argentina, then attempting Everest, and also riding to, on the Tibetan plain. So I have a series of bucket list of things I want to do. So this is just like one of them. And like the things I've done before, it's, it's actually like, um, um, you know, like I've ridden from Lagos to Ghana on a bicycle, you know, so I've done that. And you know, like doing this, like I said, is actually in conjunction with Rotary. That's why I'm actually, I'm a Rotarian, and that's why I have this. And it's actually to help address the cost of polio. You no know, polio is a problem here in Africa. Yes, Nigeria is polio free, but if we continue to, do nothing and think we are polio free as we are, it's going to come back. You know, just like virus, if it's in any part of the world, it's going to come back here. So okay. that is why we need to, you know, intensify the awareness and so that we can have improvement. I mean, you use the issue of vaccine hesitancy and people can actually take the vaccine and polio can be out of the world completely. And if that happens, I'll be a fulfilled person. We appreciate you. We wish you safety in your journey. We look forward to your visit to Lagos. And I'm sure I'll be looking forward to reading your book, which I'm sure you'll be working on. Thank you so much, Kunle yes, Adeo, uh, for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks All so right, thank much. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. And that's it on The World Today. Thank you for watching. I'm Minnesota.